All right, good morning, everybody. We are gonna go ahead and get started. It is 9.01, so we're already a minute late, and our virtual friends are waiting for us. So everybody, wave to your virtual friends. Woo! I was going to have the map here, but I forgot to bring it. It is out front. There's over 30 virtual sites going on right now in the state of California. Isn't that exciting? So I just have to compliment our team, our tech team here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You can't see them, but they're here. Oh, there's one. Anyways, welcome. My name is Kathy Wall. I am with the Inclusion Collaborative, and I am delighted that you all are here. I'm going to try to figure out technology while talking to a lot of people. Ah! And I'm being um, videotaped. It's my dream come true. <gasps> Not. At any rate, welcome, everybody. This is our fourth annual um, Inclusion Collaborative State Conference. We are amazed that it still goes. I know. It's exciting. And I just want to thank all my team. We couldn't do it without our team. Um, mostly Kim Bovario is the brains behind this. So let's all give Kim a clap. Thank you. Um, and my other, if they're wearing a, a shirt like this, please tell them how great they are because they are on their second day and they have one more day tomorrow. So yeah. I'm going to owe my team a lot. But at any rate, welcome. Um, we had a great day yesterday at our pre-conference event on preschool. And today we are um, starting kicking off our conference. So I wanted to welcome you all. Um, before I get started and not forget, I wanted to make sure everyone knows that we are actually um, having a campaign, a GoFundMe for Inova, which is a school in Napa. Um, that serves children with autism that actually burned during the fires. So we wanted to acknowledge them. Um, and you'll see these, you can either click or do your scan, or you can actually put some money in the bucket, but make sure someone sees it so no one else takes it. Um, but we have uh, different table uh, buckets out in the front for you if you'd like to donate to them. So without further ado, everyone knows where the bathrooms are. We know our cell phones should be pretty silent. You don't know where the bathrooms are. They're that way or they're that way. Okay, follow the signs. I am going to now introduce um, Kim Bovario, our program manager, who has some housekeeping things for you. Hi, everybody, good morning. Yay. Say hi to virtual people. Just wanted to review that the Inclusion Collaborative, you'll see on the placemats here in person, um, we just always have our why mission visual all the time for us. And so the Inclusion Collaborative believes that every individual, regardless of abilities and disabilities, has the right to full access to quality, inclusive learning and community environments. And four years ago, we had the opportunity to start this conference in partnership with the California Department of Education. The Inclusion Collaborative had the idea to have this conference in person and virtually throughout the state of California. All virtual sessions are live streamed and recorded for future viewing. And reflecting back to our first conference, we had 400 participants in person and virtually for ages birth to third grade. And now at our fourth conference, we have over a thousand participants for ages birth to high school. Woo! So thank you. And we really appreciate all the hard work of our 30 virtual host sites because it is hosting a conference at their sites. Um, and with that, we have over 800 attendees tuning in virtually. And we want to recognize Sacramento County Office of Education, who has been a part of the conference planning committee and is the virtual host site for four years running with over 100 attendees. Wow. And this year, our conference theme is Building Bridges for Equity, Engaging All Learners. So I really want to encourage the features of our conference today for in-person attendees. There's a table activity to build some bridges and post your pictures to the activity feed of the mobile app. And make sure you download the conference mobile app because this has a lot of features um, to interact with other attendees, session materials, evaluations, live Q&A, and CEU forms for you guys. Um, today we have Allison Murphy from Crowd Compass, who's located in our lobby today for the help desk for the mobile app if you have any questions. We're also selling books in our lobby from our published authors. And you actually have an opportunity tonight to get them signed at our networking event at Embassy Suites in Milpitas at 5.30. And tomorrow, we also will be having a closing performance from a local band called Dream Achievers. They're three young, um, talented musicians who have autism, so we'll be playing out tomorrow at 12 o'clock here in the San Jose room. I also want to thank our sponsors. We have First Five Santa Clara County, who's sponsoring our networking event tonight. We have Cengage, who sponsored breakfast yesterday. Strong Start, who's sponsoring breakfast today. Brooks Publishing will be sponsoring the breakfast tomorrow. Lakeshore has been sponsoring our coffee breaks. And Rethink Ed will be 
um, sponsoring the ice cream social with the band performance tomorrow. Please also visit the 10 exhibitors in our boardroom right over there. Um, we were able to fit in 10. So we have the Brooks Publishing, Sun Gage, Lakeshore, the Discovery Source, Goal Book, Presence Learning, Kids Included Together, KPS for Parents, West Ed Center for Prevention and Early Intervention, National University, and the Learning Multimedia Center of Santa Clara County. Um, and right now I'm about to do some thank yous, so please don't play music to, you know, get me off stage yet. But um, <laughs> it's my thank you speech. Um, so I couldn't coordinate this conference on my own. So I really want to make sure to thank the California Department of Education, the Santa Clara County Office of Education, John Gundry, Marianne Dewan, Steve Olmos, Kathy Wall, Kristen Brooks, Nancy Crow, Sung Park, Ellie Ho, Susan Larkin, Julie Kimball, Myra Montanez, Yolanda Tiana, Kathy Lewis, Lindsey Wong, Tim Walter, Kathy D. Benedetto, Monica Bravo, Adriana Lopez, Jiang Lee, Mike Bromberg, Bruce Hausman, for us the Natural Catering, our Promise Planning Committee, and finally, the post-secondary students and volunteers that we have here. And lastly, thank you to all of you for coming here. We know we have busy schedules and hard to get coverage, but it's really important to take what is learned from this conference back to the learning and community environments from where you came. Um, and make sure to learn how to build and enhance your sustain the inclusive practices because we can build bridges for equity and engage all learners. Thank you, Kim. Do you see why we couldn't do this without Kim? Come on, give her another hand. I also want to point out at your table are, is actually a table tent that tells you how to access the app. So if you're sitting and doing nothing and can't figure it out, you can look at those directions. Hi, Belinda. Nice to see you. Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Marianne Dewan. She is our deputy superintendent. She is our champion for inclusion. She makes things happen in this Santa Clara County Office of Education. And she also said, yes, Strong Start would pay for breakfast. So let's clap for her. Oh. Good morning, everyone. Um, I do want to take um, care of one housekeeping item uh, that we do as standard practice at all of our events. We do live in California. It is earthquake territory. Um, so in the event of an emergency, um, we will um, have the administrators who are on site pick up the roster. We have a clipboard over here, so there will be a designee who takes that. And then we would ask um, deck and cover under the tables. When the shaking stops, we would exit the store out to the parking lot and gather uh, in the main area. So important um, safety precautions. We just had the great shakeout earlier last week. Hopefully um, all of you got to participate in that as well. Um, so it's absolutely my pleasure to be here this morning and have a chance to welcome all of you and to be in a room full of people who share a common vision and mission for inclusive practices and particularly with the equity lens. Um, as Kathy mentioned, um, the Strong Start Coalition is sponsoring the breakfast today. And the Strong Start Coalition is one of another priorities of our office. Inclusion, inclusive practices, and the Inclusion Collaborative is one of the top priorities of the County Office of Education. And we're quite pleased to have Kathy Wall as our director of the Inclusion Collaborative. A second priority is early care and education. Um, there's a lot of overlap between early care and education and the work of the Inclusion Collaborative. Many of you might know already that the system of care and education for zero to five-year-olds in our state is quite siloed, segregated. Um, there isn't a lot of access. Quality is is of questionable um, ratings throughout the state. There isn't a lot of equity in terms of what families have access to. In addition to that, we know that a lot of young people with disabilities find that the only way for them to receive services is through a separate program. And there is not enough access just for general or natural settings um, for all of our young people to give them the strong start that they deserve. So the Strong Start Coalition was um, set up by our County Office of Education under the leadership of two of our board members initially, Grace Ma and Joseph DeSalvo, who wanted to find ways to find funding 
to expand access to early care and education. Um, as we got into this work, we developed a coalition of community members, agencies, and other entities, education, school districts, universities, et cetera. And you can see um, just a handful of our partners here on the, the slide. And what we do is advocate for increased access and quality. We also add credible literature to the field. So um, everyone has a good sense of what's happening and what the current state of early care and education is in our county as well as in the state. And we help contribute to statewide advocacy efforts as well as our own local efforts. Next. <clears throat> One of the efforts we've done in terms of the credible work is the development of the Early Learning Master Plan for Santa Clara County. Um, back in 2010, we launched our first plan. Uh, that plan expired here in 2017. So last year, we began an effort to update the Early Learning Master Plan. Um, it is very much about uh, inclusive practice and equity for zero to five-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, so you might be wondering, well, why does this matter? And why are you talking to me about this this morning? So a couple reasons. One, if you're a champion for inclusion, you should be knowledgeable and aware of the needs in the zero to five population in our state. And we really need to start thinking about an aligned system of care between infants, toddlers, uh, preschool into transitional kindergarten and throughout the K-12. And so all of us need to be united in this message at the state level. Um, there are some opportunities at the state level for advocacy, if that's something you care about, legislation and other opportunities. And also you may have, next, um, you may have opportunities in your own local communities. Um, what we know about Santa Clara County um, is not unique to our county. Many counties have very similar challenges in terms of lack of access, lack of quality, a lack of an integrated data system, an inability to monitor what happens to our youngsters after they leave zero to five services. So um, we would also encourage you to find out what's happening in your local communities. And if this is an issue that you care about, to stay aware. Um, the Community Foundation has a campaign called Choose Children. Um, we'd ask you to take a look at that, where we're looking to find a governor um, who would take on early care and education as part of their education platform as well. Um, the legislators are fully behind this work in both houses, but we've not yet had really a governor who would take this on and really understand the importance of quality early care and education. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about Strong Start, um, you can go to strongstartsantaclara.org. Strong Start Santa Clara is all one word. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge, congratulate, and recognize the director of the Strong Start Coalition, uh, Matthew Tinsley, who I think is in the room. There he is in the back. Um, Matt. Matt is also um, a true champion of young children, of inclusion, of special education, and a wonderful partner um, with me and other members of the leadership team here to further this work. Um, lastly, I want to thank um, John Gundry, our county superintendent, um, extend some welcome to all of you on his behalf. And also, just personally, I want to welcome you and just say how delighted I am to have you all here to talk about this work. And then finally, I'd like to thank our Board of Education for their unending support of the Inclusion Collaborative and the work that we've done here. I'm, this is my fifth year here at the County Office of Education. Um, and the board has been consistent in their support of inclusive practices. So with that, I want to, um, again, thank you all for being here and encourage you to reflect and have a great couple of days. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to share with you that Matt Tinsley, raise your hand, has a great voice, and he was our voiceover for one of our PSAs. So you can go to our YouTube channel and hear Matt talk about inclusive makerspaces. So thank you, Matt. Uh, we are now, we were supposed to have our California Department of Education Special Education Director here, uh, Kristen Wright, Dr. Kristen Wright, but she is, um, her daughter is ill, so she's not able to be here. Hold on a moment. This one. 
And um, so what we're going to do is say a welcome from CDE. They're just not here in person. Um, she wanted me to extend um, the welcome. And the next thing, next person I would like to welcome up is Dr. Jennifer Shantz. And she is an early learning analyst with the Office of Special Education Programs. And it's a small world. She's actually the person that Matt Tinsley, raise your hand again, can't get away from me, is working on a project uh, pay for success for preschool. So it, I'm delighted to um, have Dr. Jennifer Shantz welcome you. Great, thank you, Kathy. I'm really thrilled to be here and enjoyed, for those of you that were here yesterday, uh, talking all about the exciting work going on in California around preschool inclusion. Preschool inclusion is my love. I am a former preschool special ed teacher, and so we've really embedded a lot of our, our efforts um, in different investments on preschool inclusion. Uh, so if you want to find out what I said yesterday morning, come talk to me. Um, I highlighted a lot of our investments in early childhood inclusion, but wanted to take a quick minute just to mention a few of our new investments we've made that are more focused on the preschool through 21 world. Um, and these are things I know less about, but I can put you in touch with folks who know more about it if you're interested. Um, so through our technical assistance investments, we've invested in a new center that is being called the Ties Center. Um, and of course, we always that there's a whole lot more behind that. Um, the, the rest of the title for the center is Increasing Time, Instructional Effectiveness, Engagement, and State Support for Inclusive Practices for Students with Significant Cognitive Disabilities. And so we're really, really excited. Uh, the folks at the University of Minnesota at uh, the National Center for Educational Outcomes, or you may have heard NCEO, uh, won this grant. And it is a $2 million investment over five years, so a total of $10 million. And they have many partners involved. Um, but their purpose is really to create sustainable changes in school and district education systems so students with significant cognitive disabilities can be fully engaged in the same instructional and non-instructional um, activities with their gen ed peers and while receiving the individualized supports that they need. So clearly this is a huge uh, work scope and um, in their proposal they outlined some really innovative activities in order to figure out how to address this and how to approach it uh, around, um, they've talked a good bit about coaching that's needed in, in these systems to ensure that uh, local districts have the support they need to make this um, kind of dream a reality. So stay tuned, uh, they will be getting started, I believe at the beginning of the year, um, and a lot more to come from that center. So we're really, really thrilled uh, that that will be out there. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, we um, have funded a research and development center on developing software to adapt and customize instructional instruction in digital learning environments, and the folks from CAST and your keynote speaker <laughs> is uh, going to be heavily involved in that one. And we also believe that that investment's really going to help move things along around uh, kids with disabilities accessing um, information in a more inclusive way. So um, I don't know if Jose is going to talk at all about that investment, but he might. Um, and with that, I just really wanted to um, thank you all for sharing your stories. Um, and I'm going to be around all day today. I have to get back to DC tomorrow. Tomorrow. But um, if you have something you want to share or just to chat about from the federal level, please come see me. I'm, I'm, I really love to take stories back. I think it's really important, uh, given the hard work you all are doing on the ground, for us to be open and listening. And I, I, am, I have a loud mouth. Um, so with that, I'm going to get out of the way because I don't know if you know Jose, but he is a very dynamic uh, speaker. And um, the more time he has, the better. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Wait, hug. And she is not kidding. She is collecting stories. She has input in policy papers, et cetera, et cetera, power. She's your girl to go talk to. Um, it is now my great delight to introduce Dr. Jose Blackerby. He is the director of the West Coast Cast Office and, he, and the East Coast, but he claims he's more Californian. He's going to be here for two weeks now, which is unusual. 
halfway through the, oh, only another week. But at any rate, he also is on staff and teaches at the Harvard Graduate School of, of Education. And what else should I say about you? Jose is just amazing. He is like, you know, the guru of UDL. That's basically the way I'll describe him. And he's also my tech support, so he's going to change his slides. Go for it. Everyone clap. Woo! You, you're on. I hope so. Does this work? Does that work? Is he, can you hear him? Can you guys hear him? Closer. Closer. Isn't technology fun? How's that? Okay, good. can you all, all right. hear him? Raise your hand in the back. Can you hear me? Virtual people, raise your hands. Okay, good. All right. Great. Okay. So this is a this is a Prezi. I was um, I I have to do a lot of talks, you know, and I got to a place where I just couldn't do another PowerPoint. I just had to do something else, and uh, so I've started doing Prezi's, and they can be a little disoriented because there's a lot of animation and movement. So if you do, you know, if it gets too much, you can step outside, uh, take a breather. Um, I did want to say actually about this uh, investment. We're very very happy to uh, have won this new center. And, we, and it's about um, creating software that will provide not just accessibility supports, but learning supports for um, kids with disabilities and actually all learners. And um, it's a different kind of OSEP investment. And we're thinking about the center differently. It's more like venture capital. And so we're hoping that this is something that will get out there into the world and be used. And we may be wanting to recruit all of you. But the reason. But the reason that um, we were successful in the proposal is really because of the acronym. She read the long title, but we call it Sizzle, right? <laughs> How could you not win something with that, right, with Sizzle? OK, um, so thanks for the uh, nice introduction. And um, as Kathy mentioned, I direct uh, R&D at CAST. I teach at Harvard. Um, so I spend half my time on the East Coast, half my time on the West Coast. But I live out here, really. And I worked for many years at uh, SRI just down the street. So um, I'm very excited to be here. Seems like a great group. It looks like there's a lot to learn. So uh, I'm going to talk today um, about universal design for learning. Surprise, that's what we do at CAST, right? Um, and I want to talk about the nature of the field uh, right now. It's really different than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, 30 years ago. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we got where, from where we were to where we are. And in true UDL fashion, that, there are a whole bunch of different stories there. There's a national story that, that is important. There's a personal story for individuals. There's an organizational story for CAS. There's a policy story. So I'm going to go through um, all of that. And, um, and then I'm going to uh, finish up, and I'm going to try to recruit you by showing you some really cool, exciting things that are happening out there in the world of um, universal design for learning and also for you to be part of what is becoming a new field, right? So it's not just about CAST anymore. It is about a growing field and how do we you know, leverage all the great creati creativity and energy that's going on out there. So, uh-oh, what happened? Dynamic technology has to go. Let me just start again. There we go. I think we'll work now. It's this one right here. I got it. OK. OK. So you know, you're storytelling. You have to start somewhere. And I'm going to uh, start in the 80s, because that's when I got into the field. Um, and um, that turns out, coincidentally, that's when um, CAS started, too, as a kind of a direct service um, organization. And, um, and there are and sort, of, sort of my career and uh, the lifetime of CAST and the lifetime of Universal Design for Learning really kind of arcs over these last um, 40 years. So I'm going to give a little bit of background about um, how things got started, how I got into things. And um, oh, I did also want to mention, you guys have virtual tools, right, to provide comments and questions. There's also a Today's Meet, which, is, um, which I set up. It's a room. You can put questions, comments. Uh, compliments if you have them, you know, criticisms if they're mild. But this room will be open. Um, this, this, this will be open for a week. So you can, if things come up to you over the next few days, you can participate there. And you're going to be monitoring that, too. So you have multiple ways to um, interact in this session. All right. So let's go to the 80s. Anybody remember the 80s? A few of you. OK. OK. 
Well, the 80s, you know, we had Ronald Reagan, we had Mr. T, we had Boy George, we had Michael Jackson, um, MTV, right, was getting new media. So, land, there you go, right? So, and uh, it was, I was in my 20s, and uh, I was actually driving a cab in New York City. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And um, I ended up getting a job in Seattle because I needed money as an aide in a resource room. And so that's how I got turned into, into sort of being a fan, being interested in education, and I started paying attention. Um, it was also the time, right, where the first Macintosh came, right? So technology was beginning to um, become like a central part of our daily lives. Now, before the 1980s, um, presidential candidates did not have a platform about education. It really was not part of anybody's agenda. And A Nation at Risk was published in 1984, and uh, it was a commission analysis of the state of the American educational system, and it wasn't pretty, right? It argued that the quality and the outcomes were poor enough such that the, um, the students who were going out into the world were not prepared, and that that posed a risk for our economy and for our democracy. And so from that time on, right, every presidential candidate has had to have something to say about education. John Goodlad also published a book about high schools in the 1980s, a place called School. And um, he described a, um, an organization that was built for another time, right? A school, an organization that was structured for a day when people were working in factories, right? And increasingly, even then, we were not, yeah. I do. Okay. Maybe I'll just maybe I'll just do it manually. How about that? While we're in the middle of a tech chat, can everyone look that way? You have to get the microphone closer to your mouth. <laughs> okay. You messing with my tie? <laughs> okay. Now it's, is, is that, that better? better? Can people hear me better? Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. And I don't have to hang on. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. So yeah, place called school. So um, high schools were built for for an age when people were working in factories, and people aren't working in factories anymore. And not only that, uh, he described the place was kind of a grim, like it was kind of dull and boring, and people didn't know why they were there, and it seemed like you know a, not a great way to spend your your time for anybody. Um, and then Jonathan Kozol wrote a book called Savage Inequalities, and he kind of looked through the lens of how does the inequality and poverty in our society get reflected in our school system? And again, not super pretty, right? Um, places where you know there were low, not many resources, low-income communities, the physical infrastructure was not nearly as good, quality of instruction, availability of materials. And he would actually go on to argue that that whole system had a way of just perpetuating inequality in, um, in our schools, right? And so, you know, taken together in the 80s, um, people were saying, well, this, is, this isn't good, right? This isn't good. This isn't going to work. Um, the consequences are bad, bad for the democracy, bad for the economy. Um, we, it, um, we have achievement gaps that are unacceptable. So, um, you know, something had to be done. And um, during the 80s, and I think really probably ever since, right? I mean, Americans do take on problems, right? And so politicians took note, I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, but then lots of people kind of jumped into the water. I was one of them, right? But you have all kinds of people at different levels of the system wanting to make it better. You know, teachers, administrators, researchers, professors, also a bit Interestingly, for the first time, we're getting entrepreneurs and funders who were not traditionally um, in the mix also um, interested. Now, I was one of them. And uh, it's funny because like, when I was like in my 20s, um, my family was really worried about my employability. You know? <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't I said, what are you talking about? I'm fine. <laughs> and now I look at my, one of my first ID badges, I see they had a point. You know, um, So. Uh, God bless Mary Wagner for uh, um, hiring me that I didn't know what to wear on ID badge day. So uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, 
But let's like just backtrack what was happening in the 80s. Like, so I went to, I got my, my teaching credential. IDEA was not even IDEA at that point. Um, LRE was really more about physical act of school, really worried about physical inclusion. Um, a lot of the instructional approaches were really basic skills oriented. Um, for kids with more significant support needs, we were working on functional skills. Later in the decade, whole language started. Anybody remember whole language? Yes, right? And, um, but then if you also, if you were in special ed, you learned, at least in the Northwest, you learned about applied behavior analysis and precision teaching, and you charted behavior very carefully, right? So that was kind of the, the, um, the milieu. Um, so then there's a lot of activity, right? There's a lot of activity over the last 20 years trying to make things better, right? So one that we're all very familiar with is IDEA, right? IDEA has been reauthorized, what now, four times? So we got early childhood included, and then we moved towards accessing the curriculum, and then eventually it became accessing accountability systems. And now we're actually thinking about you know, improving, like lowering achievement gaps and actually focusing on, on learning. And there have been um, a series of reauthorizations of um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and uh, No Child Left Behind, ESSA are examples of that, but those have uh, at each, each iteration kind of changed the nature of the game around accountability. A lot of people don't like No Child Left Behind, but we learned a lot from you know, how our schools are actually doing with particular subgroups in particular. Right? But a lot of activity, a lot of money, um, and there have been lots of initiatives over the last 20 years from the Department of Education, many of them really good, reading and math panels, um, focusing on STEM, um, uh, technology and innovation, lots of initiatives, and also formerly grant programs trying to improve access and quality and the outcomes of the educational system. NSF is in the, was in the game too. They started a Persons with Disabilities program that ran for about 15 years. Now, NSF tries to include disability in all of its funding programs, sort of a focus area for both broadening participation, but also for um, just designing um, solutions that make sense, not just for kids with disabilities, but for all kids. And the other thing that's kind of important is that we actually spend a lot more money, right? With the exception of the crash, that little crash that happened about 10 years ago, there was that little problem. Um, outside of that, though, um, we actually been spending more. So we're spending per capita more money now um, educating kids both in general and special education than we were 20 years. So we have taken a run at this, right? We've put human capital, political capital, and money at trying to make things better. And um, we had a lot of good ideas, right? I mean, look, a lot of these things that you see up here are um, featured in, the, um, in this conference, right? Inclusion. We're actually, no one's debating whether we should do inclusion more. It's how we do it. We've actually thought more systematically about what standards are and what it is we want kids to learn, but not just what, but how we want them to be able to learn. Um, we've gotten better at assessments. We've learned a lot more about teaching reading and mathematics. In the 80s, curriculum-based measurement was kind of a, you know, a folksy tool that um, Stan Dino developed in Minnesota, and now every major publisher is making gazillions of dollars, using them in, in RTI systems, lots of education technology, universal design for learning, self-determination, growth, all these things, right? These are really um, good ideas, right? Good ideas. So um, how do we do? We're database people, right? So we should be serious about how we've done so that we can learn for the future, right? And, Turns out, right, that um, there's actually some really pretty good news. Um, in terms of inclusion, we have trends pretty much going in the direction that people want to see, right? More kids are spending more time in general education classes over time. It's not perfect, but it's certainly um, getting better. Um, it's also true that there are some indicators where things are really a lot better. Right? So in the early 90s, uh, kids with disabilities were going to college at a rate of, you know, in the single digits. 25 years later, that number has tripled. Right? That is huge. Right? That is not easy to do. And some of that's education, some of that's awareness. 
But getting kids into both two and four year uh, institutions is really, really uh, incredible. And there's some um, groups of students who actually uh, go to post-secondary education at rates higher than uh, the general population. So that's the good stuff. But not all of the news is good, right? So um, the scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, I'll show a chart in a minute, are not great. Um, the accountability scores, also not great. Um, dropout rates, also better, but not great. Um, you know, anytime there's an international comparison, a study, whether it's PISA um, or any of them, usually, you know, we land in the middle of the pack. We're not number one like we like to be. Um, we still have our achievement gra gaps, and the school reform stuff, it takes, uh, it's taken a long time. So here are the NAEP scores. You don't need to be, have a PhD in you know, statistics to see how that's going. Um, pretty flat. Um, these are the accountability test scores um, from a couple of years ago by state. Interestingly, I mean, they are generally lower than you'd like to see. There's also huge variability, right? So some states do um, quite a bit better than others. Probably an artifact of their testing system more than any other thing. Um, and here are the, the dropout numbers, right? So, Again, you know, there's some improvement, but um, not, not what we want and hope for our kids. Okay, so now let's go to universal design for learning. So like, um, it's one of those big ideas, right? It's a big idea. It's growing, right? It's one of these things that um, people, whether they're in preschool or they teach college or even in the workforce, you know, this idea of universal design for learning kind of like, you know, like means something to them, right? It's like, oh yeah, I get that, you know? Because you say that kid, that kid's different from that kid. And people are like, yeah, duh, I've been teaching for 20 years, I know that, right? How can we embrace that variability and have um, programs and schools and systems that actually do a better job with it? Before I, before I get into UDL, raise your hand if you, how, if you know about UDL. So pretty much, I don't know, so 60% of you probably. How many of you would say that you implement UDL? Okay, a lot fewer. How many of you could say you know UDL when you see it? Okay, right, I think that's pretty, so you guys are kind of, usually when I give these talks, they're, you know, the numbers are different, right, but it always goes down, right? I mean, people have awareness, smaller numbers of people actually are doing it in some way, and then others are kind of not sure, you know, what it means. But, so, you know, UDL started with a small group of people at, at CAST. It's grown over time. People have contributed thoughts to, to refining the model. And so we've gotten kind of better at telling the core bits of the story. So I'll try to hone in on what a couple of those are right now. So the first one is this idea of learner variability, right? And again, it makes sense. People know the kids different from, or differ from one another. Um, and that um, probably, right, the kids who differ from one another probably could benefit from different sorts of um, educational experiences. Now, um, Todd Rose, um, who used to work at Cast and is now at Harvard, has written a book called The End of Average. Anybody read it? Oh, we should get it out there, because Todd needs some extra money. And you guys want to read it? Um, <laughs> So Todd wrote this book called The End of Average, and he applies it to education, but he's really applying it um, more broadly in, in society, right? That there is this idea that there is an average learner or an average person, and that we build systems around that. And he asks the question, is that accurate, right? So um, he comes, he has a great uh, example he starts the, the book with, and it's around World War II. And uh, the war was going on, and the Air Force was developing a new fighter jet that was going to be faster and more nimble and give the US an advantage in the air war. And um, these were very expensive. And in, when they were um, getting them launched, they were having a lot of crashes, right? More than they expected. And so they were losing planes. It's expensive. They were losing pilots. They're expensive, too. <laughs> So um, they wanted to figure out why. 
And uh, so they hired some researchers from Brown, and um, they went to Northrop Grumman, and they said, okay, what's uh, going on, and how did you design this thing? And they're like, well, we got some specs that the Air Force gave us, and that's how we build our co built the cockpit. And they said, well, where was that from? And they're like, well, that was from like the First World War. And they were like, oh, okay, so you've got you know, some specs that are 20, 20 years out of date, and probably pilots are different now, right? So we have a whole airplane that's built for people who don't exist. So they're researchers. They went out and they got another group of current pilots on those same measures, and they tried to um, see, oh, they must be different. Well, it turned out they weren't, right? Pilots actually looked kind of the same. So then they had to think a little, a little bit, well, what's going on here? And um, they thought, well, OK, let's look at all of these different dimensions. And, um, and, you know, and this is an example here. We've got you know, height, weight, shoulders, and things like that. And what they assumed was that most of the pilots would be close to the average on most things, right? That just seemed sort of a natural conclusion. So what percent of pilots do you think were close to the average on most things? Zero, right? There, were, there was nobody who fit that. And so if you look at these two guys, this is an illustration. I don't know if they're pilots or not. Um, <laughs> But you can see, right, that they differ from one another, right? Height, weight, reach, shoulders, all, in all these ways, they're different. And in no case are they average. So in the Second World War, and you know, the Air Force has some clout, you know, so they, could, they actually said, oh, why don't you build the cockpit so that it can accommodate these differences, right? So they had to make them adjustable for reach, for um, the angle of sitting, all this. So, the, so they built a more kind of UDL cockpit, right, which reduced the number of crashes. So, um, so it's not hard to apply this to education, right? So here's this young woman. She comes to school. She's got a lot of strengths. She's good at, um, she's curious. She's, she's got cognitive strengths. She's got a lot of background knowledge, but she has some weakness in reading and vocabulary and perceptual abilities. Those are all probably relevant to learning. So she's not average on anything, right? And so Todd's point is, when we build for the average, we build for no one, right? And that's kind of a big, really important point, right? The average is a statistical thing, but most people don't fit that statistical thing. Okay. All right. So here are the universal design for learning guidelines that you can find on the CAST website. This is the version three of those. How many of you have seen this? OK, a bunch of people, OK. So um, just a, a couple of things about the guidelines, right? They came out of 20 or 30 years of what we've learned about how our brains function, right? And in general, they're connected to three networks, right? broadly speaking, three networks. And we all use those networks. They're all essential, but we all use them in different ways, and we combine them in different ways. The first network is called the engagement network, and it's at the center of your brain. And it is the part of your brain that makes you care about stuff. right? It makes you want to do things. It makes you curious. It makes you motivated. And it's the part of your brain that helps you persist when you move through difficulty, right? And that is, right, central to learning, right? Um, now, there are two other um, parts of the, the two sets of guidelines, one based on the recognition network and then the other on the strategic network. In a prior version of the UDL guidelines, engagement was on the right side, right? Now, we have moved the engagement um, guideline to the left to actually signal the primacy of emotion, motivation, and interest and persistence as the basis for, like, if we don't do this well, everything else isn't going to matter. So then we also have the recognition network. That is the stuff of education, facts, figures, knowledge, relationships, and skills. Um, we all use our recognition networks um, very differently. And then we have the um, strategic network, which is our ability to plan, right? Sometimes it's just you know, making a plan to get here, for example, today. We had to use our strategic networks to do that. 
Um, long range planning, whether you're doing policy or doing a class project, that's using your strategic network. And again, um, we use those differently and um, they all need to work in consort for learning to be optimized. Another thing about the guidelines is that there is a movement from kind of lower level access, right? So for example, rep multiple rep means of representation, sort of changing fonts and things like that, providing low level supports, all the way up to more strategic, more expert learning where we're activating background knowledge getting students to move towards becoming expert learners. And so all three of them have this direction of, we want kids to get to be motivated, to be resourceful, become a planner, and this gets them more independent over time. So that's when we are working on a, a new version of the um, guidelines, which will probably be out next year. They won't be changing a lot, but um, don't go print a million of these just yet. Um, in terms of telling the story about learner variability, um, and how it plays out in schools. One of the things we talk about with all this variability is we talk about barriers, right? So, you know, for some people, text by itself is a real barrier. You open up that book and that is a drag, right? Um, and so we want to use the UDL framework to identify opportunities, ways to reduce or eliminate barriers. And this is kind of just a nice illustration about um, how you might go about doing this. So here we have three kids. They're trying to see a baseball game. They're of different heights, and there's a fence, right? In this first one, everybody gets the same support. They all get a box, right? They all stand on the box, and um, it works for these two guys, right, because they're tall enough to see over the fence. But this guy over here doesn't help him, right? He's gotten the same support as everybody else. This middle one, we've actually changed the nature of the supports, right? We provided more supports, and in another case, we didn't provide supports because he didn't need it, right? And so here we have an example of kind of an accommodation, right, that is allowing everybody to, uh, to see, and we've done it by varying the kinds of supports. But then in a UDL way, kind of the best thing you can do is actually change the nature of the barrier. So here we have a fence everybody can see through, right? And so you're not providing accommodations anymore. You built something that was more inclusive, more accessible from the get-go. OK, so CAST um, kind of formulated um, UDL in the early 90s coming out of universal design in architecture, right? And that was this whole idea of you know, ramps instead of stairs, and um, this idea that if you retrofit, you have a worse solution than if you um, build it from the start. Curb cuts, right, which were intended for people in wheelchairs, also benefit skateboarders and business people with um, luggage rollers and all kinds of people, and people who just um, prefer not to step off steps. So, um, so using that idea, UDL and, and uh, CAST developed some solutions in the education space. And we're talking here the 90s through the, the 2000s. So the first one was, um, the web was coming into to, um, reality, was becoming part of our everyday life. And um, that was going to be great for a lot of us to new ways to communicate, new access to information. But there was going to create barriers for um, a lot of other people, including people with disabilities. And so the Bobby system, which is sort of morphed into what now we can think of as Section 508, found that these web resources need to be made accessible in lots of different ways for um, people with disabilities. Um, CAS started thinking about, well, how could we use UDL in, uh, in the literacy domain? There was a program called WiggleWorks, which was sold for um, many years on by Scholastic, successful. CAS still gets a royalty from it, believe it or not. Um, and uh, there have been centers now for 20 years, uh, funded mostly by OSEP, um, looking at accessible educational materials, thinking hard not just about text anymore, but also about video, and web resources and how to make those things accessible um, to students with disabilities at, with the same quality, but then also at the same time as general education peers. And of course, this is we're kind of this is a ongoing uh, ongoing challenge, right? Because the nature of the materials is changing rapidly as well. Um, UDL can be found parts of it in Read 180. Does anybody know Read 180? Anybody use it? A lot of you. Okay. 
So READ 180 is one of the most successful intervention programs that's been used. Um, and um, it actually made more money for uh, Scholastic than Harry Potter. And Harry Potter did OK, you know? <laughs> and uh, Thinking Reader uh, as well, right? So UDL is being kind of embraced more and more in kind of mainstream um, uh, curriculum offerings. There's also a NIMIS standard and a, uh, a federal resource called NIMAC to have publishers or, uh, produce, uh, produce textbooks that can be produced in multiple formats for students with disabilities. And that is kind of institutionalized now, right? So that's, uh, there's a lot of progress, right? That's actually very, very good. OK. Now, um, you know, when we used to go to CEC, there would be, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, there would be a bunch of presentations on UDL, and we would know everybody. It would be all our friends, right? It would be like we'd all go and we'd have dinner together and drinks and stuff, and there'd be this little club. And it's not this little club anymore. There were uh, this last CEC, it was in Boston, so there was a lot of emphasis there for us. And um, there were uh, like 60 presentations, and I didn't know hardly anybody, right? So it's taken off. People are running in different directions with it. Using UDL, we went to some of these things. Some of them looked fabulous, and I was like, I want to work with you. And others were like, you said UDL, but you didn't mention it at all during the presentation. It wasn't clear, right? So we have people thinking about it different ways, implementing it in different ways. So there's like promise and, and risk, right? The other thing is it's global, right? This is not, so these, these little dots, these are people who um, logged into a webinar that we were hosting. And um, you can see it's all it's very North America focused, but there are people, and I don't know what they're doing up there in northern Norway um, around UDL, but there is interest globally, right? And so it's well beyond caste, it's well beyond our caste cadre. It's becoming a field, right? That we don't have direct control over. Um, UDL is mentioned in ESSA, I think, 11 times. Um, it's mentioned prominently in both of the recent ed education technology plans. It's in the education, um, the EdTech Developer's Guide. There are books out there and resources about how to implement UDL within higher education. There are plenty of books out there, again, people we, who we don't know necessarily, um, who are providing guidance about how to teach, use UDL for inclusion. Um, there are companies learning management just systems, ITS, who have adopted UDL as their entire framework, like all of their, all of their marketing materials, their entire system is intended to support universal design for learning through learning management systems. And even internationally, like, the Australians are into it, right? And the Australians are fun to hang out with, so, you know. So anyway, that's the context. What, so what does that mean? So, um, I'm really, really optimistic about this change. Um, but it's worth asking the question, how can you be so sure that the data aren't just going to be the same, the, the ugly data that we just showed a few minutes ago? How can you be so sure that it's not going to just be that again? How can you be sure? And of course, I can't be, right? And we do have to you know, be a little bit sanguine, right? The nation, in a lot of ways, still is at risk. Um, lots, way too many kids with disabilities don't succeed once they make it into um, uh, once they make it into their young adulthood, and the world has changed a lot, right? Than it was in the '80s. So this is um, uh, Klaus Schwab. He runs the World Economic um, um, Forum. That you know they meet in Davos. All those smarty pants guys, wealthy guys over there. Um, but he like looks at the world and he says there is innovation and promise and opportunity like there's never been before. And there's risk like there's never been before, right? So we are you know, entering a, a totally different time. We have to prepare kids to go into this world, not the world that existed 20, 20 years ago. Um, all of you know, you live here in the valley or you work here in the valley. Um, you know all about technology, automation, um, what that's doing to lots and lots of jobs, right? The nature of work is changing and the nature of, uh, of our work is gonna have to change um, as well. And there's more inequality now, not less, 
right? And so that's, that's the world that our, our kids are going into. So we have a whole bunch with some of the same challenges, and then we also have some new ones now, right? So we're going to have to um, think differently. So um, I know some of you are probably thinking, like, why are you bringing up all this bad news, dude? Like, why do you have to be such a buzzkill? And, um, and it's actually, that's not a buzzkill. I'm actually super excited and it has nothing to do with medication or anything like that. I really do think that um, all of this hard work and effort and innovation is going to make a difference. And I'm going to explain um, why I think so. So I am um, fortunate that I get to go around the country and to meetings like this and uh, meet with people who are you know, doing all kinds of innovative things. And, and when, you, when you listen to keynote speeches, frequently you're here, you'll hear that you know, schools, the way they used to be, in our lifetimes are not going to look that way anymore, right? We're going to be thinking about place differently, thinking about who can teach, how we um, credential people differently. The physical spaces could be think of, thought of differently, how we organize instruction. And there are a lot of really exciting ideas. This is just a really nice one that came from IBM, of all places, like another vision about what um, schools and education um, could look like. There are some places where people are thinking about the physical space differently, right? So there's a school in Florida called PK Young. They, they had their, their new school was designed by the people who design Starbucks. And they were thinking about it in a UDL way, right? They're like, oh, why do we have all these, these um, chairs? Like, well, we should have quiet spaces and individual spaces and comfortable spaces and different places that, that set up different learning environments. And then, of course, all of the technology that is rapidly changing all around us, right? That is changing how we access information, how we communicate, how we take it in, how we, how we can report what we've learned, that is just going to continue to change and create opportunity and, and, and risk both. But I think it's part of the solution. The other thing that is different right, is that there are new players at the table. right? For most of the last 20 years, 30 years, most of the investment in change came from government agencies, right? Like federal initiatives to try to generate change. And that is really, really different now, right? So, you know, we have um, big tech firms right here in the Valley who are being serious about this, right? Google spent $20 million on a disability challenge two years ago. Uh, Microsoft, which is, did you guys notice Microsoft got cool again recently? Did anyone notice that? Part of the reason they got cool is they adopted an inclusive design system throughout the company, right? Thinking about designing in the margins, and you know the surface is pretty cool. I haven't given up my Apple yet, but it's pretty cool. Um, Amazon um, is thinking really hard about uh, accessibility in UDL in their devices, and also in all of the media that they sell, right? So this is, these are new voices, right? Then of course there's. Um, Lots of interest from philanthropy here in California, but also uh, around the country and the world, who are bringing big dollars, right? Big, big dollars to stimulate innovation, help um, schools and districts implement it, CZI, um, Gates, Poses, and others, right? It's a different landscape, right? P these are um, influential people with resources who, um, are inter who recognize the importance of education and are trying to invest in it. But more importantly, are all these smaller players, right? Um, startups, uh, programs like the Inclusion Collaborative here, um, nonprofits. So for example, Text Help does this, started with great literacy support tools, text-to-speech. Now they have um, literacy supports and math supports and uh, writing supports, it's a great group. Um, it's learning, as I mentioned, is an LMS system. Goldbook, I think, is here. And they are a local startup. And um, they are helping teachers develop IEPs that are standards and, and UDL aligned. Um, Filament is based out of, um, out of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And they build UDL games, right? They're actually recognizing like motivation what is it about games, right? Kids will pay games for hours and hours and hours. Why can't we harness that for educational purposes? And then there's the, um, the UDL implementation network, 
which started eight years ago and is growing and is um, helping catalyze this community of people trying to implement UDI. So it's, and this is just the sampling, right? This is just not intended to be, all, but it's a different world, right? Big players, medium-sized players, and well, so that's great, right? Then also, the government is also thinking differently too, right? So OSEP recently initiated, not recently anymore, but uh, several years ago, this idea about results-oriented accountability really different than counting the number of kids and the number of teachers, right? Really saying, okay, let's actually think about what we want to accomplish and how we will get there and let's measure our progress. That's different. Okay, then there are um, some really cool things happening which um, take on different kinds of problems for at different levels but all give me a lot of reason um, for hope. So. The first thing I want to talk about is all these people now interested in UDL, um, whether they are administrators or teachers or higher educators, like if they say, yeah, I, I know how to do UDL, how do you know, right? I mean, there isn't a, a stamp of approval anywhere. Um, it's a framework. It's not a single program. So how could we go about uh, coming up with a more systematic way so that you might know if you were uh, you know, a building uh, principal and, and you wanted to hire a teacher who knew something about UDL, is there any way that you could um, uh, know, right? So CAST and um, the IRN have been working on that problem now for a couple of years. And so we tried to look at the broader world, like what is the world looking like now? And one of the things we have discovered is that we live in an age of platforms, right, that enable us to do stuff, right? So some of you probably took Uber to get here today, right? Uber doesn't own any cars, right? They don't, they're the biggest taxi company in the world, they don't any, own any cars, and nobody heard about them 10 years ago, right? Similarly with Airbnb, right? Biggest, uh, second biggest hotel company in the world, doesn't own a hotel room. Um, and all of these things are other examples of platforms, right, that facilitate um, purchasing goods, facilitate services, and we're wondering, well, maybe there's something to that, right? The other thing that's going on is that there's this interest in thinking differently about what credentials are and what they mean, right? Because when you get a teaching credential, I mean, I remember when I got a special ed teaching credential in Washington State, I was certified to teach any, per, any kid with disability from preschool through 21, um, vision, hearing, I, hearing, I couldn't do ASL, but I was still certified to teach them, right? So there's, a, there's this interest in knowing more about um, what teacher's skills are. And so there's this movement coming up about micro-credentialing and badging. And this is an example of digital promise. And we thought, well, that seems something that could work in a UDL um, system. And then, you know, we asked ourselves, well, is anything like that happening in education beyond what digital promise is doing? And it turns out um, there are some really interesting examples. Um, this is the LEADS program from the US Green Building Council. Has anybody seen these things, right? You see? Yeah, so there are lots of schools out there where they get certified as being, this happens to be schools that is platinum certified. But you can be gold or silver or bronze, and those are voluntary systems where schools go through a process to say, you know, we have access to public transportation, we have natural light, we have no asbestos, right? Now, the thing that's interesting about uh, the process, first of all, it's voluntary. It provides both certification for buildings and credentials for individuals. And it's kind of a UDL process. So here's um, the benchmarks for uh, new construction. And so, you know, there are elements around sustainability and water and energy and material and resources. And some things are required. Like, you know, you really can't have asbestos. It's really not okay. So, you gotta certify that. But then for the other ones, you get points, right? And you can choose, right? Schools can choose how they are gonna meet the, the, the threshold number, right? So that's a very UDL thing. You're not doing it one way. You're doing it in a way that makes sense in your local context. And we thought, that seems like something that might make sense, um, that we might be able to borrow. And they also have a platform, right? Which brings together resources for architects, and building soups and um, facilities advisors, but also people who are um, credentialed to evaluate buildings, right? And this has become a self-sustaining system, voluntary system that runs um, on its own. 
So um, with some funding from the Oak Foundation, we have started a initiative called the Certification and Credentialing Initiative. Um, that's our, that's our, um, our uh, URL right there. Um, and we are in the process of building some credentials and credentials for uh, individuals and certifications for buildings and for ed tech providers. Um, and we're building it on a platform that we're, we actually borrowed from the, the LEADS program. So we're in the process of building those and um, we are gonna be doing a field test actually this fall, anybody who's interested in participating. Um, but in a true uh, like kind of UDL design way, we wanna think about our users. And so there are in-service teachers who have some needs that we want the system to be able to, to address. They wanna learn more, they wanna be recognized. Um, districts have a different set of needs and they would need some different resources. They may also have things to share with others, right, that they could provide for free or they could provide to, um, they could, or they could uh, sell. Similarly with uh, higher ed and with vendors, right? So we have different kinds of needs, different kinds of, um, of uh, users. And um, we want to have a flexible system where users can define what their needs are and have multiple pathways to credentials or certifications depending on if they're uh, an individual or a um, company or a, a district. And this is just an example of the system as it currently exists now. There are learning resources that come from CAS, but lots of other places as well where um, users can log in and they can access some of the resources are free, some of them are for pay, um, but that they have an individualized pathway to a associate credential or a full credential, and we'll be developing more credentials um, over time. So the hope is that we have more a more uh, rational system for as this field grows, so we know what are the skills, knowledge, skills, and abilities that you want to see in someone or in an organization around universal design for learning. Um, we're getting better about how to implement things like UDL, right? Ten years ago, we really weren't thinking about it. You know, David Rose was not going around talking about how do you do it in a real school system, right? The IRN was instrumental in starting people thinking about that, and we're getting better at that now, right? We have some good models. There are some good, a lot of good professional development going out there from, by lots of places, and that's building on implementation science and, um, and improvement science. And so that's great. We've uh, elements of change are there. We do live in the age of evidence, right? And um, we have been, as a field, getting more rigorous and getting better at it, but we have a long way to go. And in the area of UDL in particular, there is a lot of evidence for each of the guidelines. If you look at the neuroscience and the, and the psychological science behind the guidelines, but it's pretty limited evidence around local implementation, right? We have, we have some prototypes. There's a little bit. It's growing. So we need to develop more, right? And there will no doubt be good news and bad news, and we have to be grown-ups about that and learn from the places where it doesn't work and, um, and uh, celebrate where we're um, successful. And then finally, and I, the most exciting part, is there are really, really uh, cool things that people are doing with the framework. Um, out there. So this is a, a, a CAST um, uh, literacy platform um, funded by OSEP called UDO. And this was focused on middle school students who had had a history of failure in reading. And by failure in reading, it means that they land in middle school, they're still two to three years back, and they've been going through a lot of remediation already, right? So they've been in class where they've focused on decoding. You can't decode, let's work on decoding. You still can't decode, let's work on decoding. You still can't decode, let's work on decoding. So um, <laughs> what you learn by that is probably you're not great at decoding, and you also realize that you're not enjoying it, right? You're not, uh, you know, when it comes to that time of the day, you're not super psyched. Think back to the, uh, to the framework, your engagement is low, your motivation is low, right? So the, the design idea was how do we we would call these kids refugees from reading. How do we get them back, right, to interacting with text and being doing all the things that we love about text, right? How do we get them getting information, communicating, sharing, right? So what UDO does is it has grade level content 
that provide supports for the kids who do have trouble with um, decoding and vocabulary, but has high interest stuff, the stuff that their peers are doing, right? So they get to read about Beyonce and, you know, and about LeBron James and about texting and driving and legalizing marijuana and all that stuff. Um, and, um, and then they also use those information that after they read, they get um, supported in the habits that good readers do, looking for main idea, looking for supporting, um, supporting details, and then putting those in kind of well-scaffolded reports that they can share with their peers and discuss, right? So we've had some preliminary evidence that kids who are really, really far behind and didn't like reading were reading, uh, sustaining interest in you know, a particular content area over year. So um, it's very exciting. There, there's more work to do, but um, starting with um, using the engagement principle, we're very proud of it. Um, museums are learning environments too. And um, the Museum of Science in Boston, but also he, out here at the Exploratory, I'm thinking about like, well, how do we know whether uh, a exhibit is any good or not? Like, how do you know it was valuable, right? Is it just that people come? Um, what are the barriers that are in the, the exhibit? And so there's some very exciting things, actually, that are going on now about thinking about museum exhibits from a UDL perspective. How do we make it valuable? How do we make it, how do there be options? How do we address um, elements of the framework? Here's filament games that, that I mentioned before. Gaming is uh, an untapped resource. Um, this one came out of my class um, last, last um, fall. There were some students in there who were, uh, who were like, we're introverts. We don't like to raise our hands and talk. And you're just in here, like you're saying, who wants to say something? And then the same five people always raise their hand and talk, right? And so they actually developed a program which they're set, which is going to be sold, which is going to change that dynamic, right? Not eliminate, you know, the, we don't want to send the people who want to talk out into the hall, but provide other ways. So the back channel is one way, but there came a whole bunch of low tech and high tech ways to get feedback and to have the conversation in the classroom be rich, but not biased in one from one response um, category. Makerspaces, you guys are doing amazing stuff in makerspaces. It's one of the most exciting things in uh, education. We did a thing at South by Southwest, which was really well attended, was really, really fun. And, um, and we're just starting to actually think about like how do you make a, a makerspace from a UDL perspective and design from the margins and so on. And um, you guys are doing great work. I, if you guys haven't had a chance to come, you should come. There's going to be one in December? Maybe. Something? Anyway. Go to your PSA. Go to your PSA. All right. How am I doing on time? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. OK, good. I'm doing great. Um, all right. I want to. Um, end by showing you a, um, a product that we're working on right now that we call Corgi. So Corgi um, is a, comes out of a, a investing in innovation grant focused on higher order thinking skills at the secondary level. And um, this, is a, this is an SRI, I3 project with CAST as a, as a sub. And the interesting thing about the I3 program is that successful applicants have to kind of uh, thread a needle. They want some evidence of promise, and you have to be innovative at the same time, right? So a lot of times they're innovative. When you're innovative, you don't always have evidence because you're innovating, right? Like you're not. So it's a hard thing to do. Um, we teamed with um, the University of Kansas, um, who uh, had over many years built uh, tools and routines around the strategic instruction model. So our strategy was to take that research-based, really good ideas, and support them with, a, with uh, UDL technology and um, see if we can um, make it richer and um, make it look like it's a modern thing. So um, this, I'm going to just show you a couple of these things. This is the unit organizer. This is the thing that most people are familiar with that come out of KU, but basically the idea is you know, there's a lot of content. It's hard to know what content is most important. Is there a way to graphically chunk it so we can get the most important things, establish what the relationships are, where the content fits in the broader uh, scope of the school year? And um, you know, this is about the Roaring Twenties, but you also have questions that you want 
um, students to be able to uh, answer at the end of the experience. And there's a little uh, piece here about the kind of thinking that we want kids to be able to um, engage in. In addition to the unit organizer, there are what are called cause and, um, content enhancement routines, um, which are focused on different kinds of, of higher order thinking. So this happens to be a cause and effect guide. It has a structure, a numerical structure that takes students through um, a, a particular process. In this case, it's about the Roaring Twenties. There's a question, there's some background knowledge, there's information about the event, there are causes and connections that are precursors, and then there are the effects of those. And so the idea is, is that if, as kids use this device, they start learning about cause and effect thinking. And there are um, other um, content enhancement routines. One, this one is focused on comparing, right? We have mass culture in the 20s, mass culture today, like characteristics, unlike characteristics, categories, and so on. And we get an analysis at the end about how the, the mass culture has changed over time. And, um, and there's a question exploration guide too. So what do you notice about these devices? What do they, what kind of technology do you think were used to deliver them? You guys, you guys remember overhead projectors? <laughs> so if these look like they were designed for overhead projectors, that's because they were. That was the technology that they had, right? And so the i3 project, we were like, well, what if you were designing this stuff today, right? And you were thinking about it from a UDL perspective, what would you do? Well, you wouldn't use a overhead projector. So what we came up with instead is a Google app, which I will um, show you now. So the way that um, Corgi works is, oh, I have to, you can't see it, can you? Maybe I can, there it is, okay. So the way that Corgi works, it's just like any other Google app. Everybody use Google apps? Yeah, docs, slides, all the things you can do, collaboration, all that stuff. So if you go to, um, if you go just to new, you've got your standard docs here, but you go down to more, and then you see there's an example of Corgi. And you open up Corgi, if the web is good, and it will load a screen that looks like that. Very good, okay? And then if you, uh, so now we have, if there's some things in here that look kind of similar, this is a Google app, and if you open the a cause and effect guide, for example, right, we have what is a, um, what is now a Google app. I can share this with Jennifer, and then she and I can collaborate on the different parts of the guide, right? Um, we can, um, enter text, we can share this with a teacher who can comment. So you can see we've already got a whole bunch, we get all the things that Google builds in, we get those for free, and then we build in some other UVDL supports around it. So one of the things that we like to do, I'll actually go to the Roaring Twenties, is that right? There we go, so this is the same, um, this is the same Roaring Twenties um, cause and effect that we saw before as a PowerPoint document. So this is now just a completed, um, it's the same kind of content, but what the technology allows us to do is bring the supports into the dot. So one of the things we want kids to know is like, well, what is cause and effect all about? Why, why does that? So we want to do that in a UDL way, and so we have one way to do it is we can say, oh, let's see, some kids like video these days. Let's, let's put a video in. The cause and effect guide helps us think through all kinds of cause and effect relationships. These relationships can be found in actions, procedures, and ideas. We will use the word event for all of these situations that have causes and effects. When we're asked questions requiring cause and effect reasoning, we can use this guide to explain the event, its causes, and effects. We'll also be able to discuss or write about our reasoning. The online guide works similar to a Google Doc, so you can co-construct this guide with classmates. There are so you get the idea, and so we have videos like that for all of the guides. We also have text for, you know, for students who can work with text, and then if people have decoding problems, we can have text-to-speech, and with any luck it will work. Come on. 
We use this cause and effect guide to explain an event, its causes and effects. Watch the video tutorial and click on the information icons in each section for more information on how to complete the guide. So we can also um, provide examples, right? That's another way to provide access to things. Say, oh, let's, can you show me one that has already been completed, right? And so here's an example, an annotated example of, here's how it looks when you finish one that's of, um, of high quality. And then we also, um, we also provide supports, in addition to vocabulary supports, we also pr provide supports right where the students need it, right? Because sometimes you get through this process and you're like, what is it causing effect, causing causes and connections again? Oh, okay, in this box, this is exactly what you have to do. So we built Corgi uh, with the help of teachers and students here in California and in Virginia. We weren't sure if this was gonna work at all, but you know, kids are ahead of us on this stuff, right? They have no problem co-collaborating on this at all. And um, so it's, it's pretty exciting. And the people at the University of Kansas, um, you know, who are the authors of these guides, see this as like, oh, this is obviously the next generation. This is obviously the next way to go. We are uh, conducting a study, actually, um, this spring on it. So we also have um, uh, cause, we also have question exploration and um, compare contrast. So. Yes, go ahead. The questionnaire. Oh, the question. Oh, just a moment. Haven't I been mic'd up this whole time? You have, but let's wait. Can we wait until okay. questions for five minutes? Thank you. Okay. For a few more minutes. Okay. Um, where is my. Oh, okay. So let me. I do want to get the questions a little bit. And I do want to. Um, just say thank you so much. It's so awesome to be here today. And all of these things that I'm talking about, Corgi, all these projects, these are all opportunities to collaborate with CAST, IRN, and others. So please, please, please stay in touch with me. We're always interested in new collaborations. I do respond not always as fast as I should, but uh, please, please, please do. And um, this is a great event um, for you guys to come together. And, you know, learn from everyone. Um, I, the class I teach at Harvard, it's just, I have such imposter syndrome going there. And like all of the students like have IQ so much higher than mine. Like I totally, it's like weird that I'm the one getting paid. So um, thank you guys very much. And we can talk about some questions right now, but I really, really do view this as an opportunity for, to have new friends and partners and using UDL in innovative ways so that we won't be able to show those ugly NAEP slides anymore. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Were there questions? Well, I know I'm gonna. We have a question. We have two. Well, well, they're, they're both very, very similar. Okay. okay. When will Corgi be available? So Corgi is in a um, is in a field test mode right now. So it's I mean it's actually if you know the URL you can get in there and. If you're nice to me, I might even give it to you. Um, uh, but, the, but the idea is it's, it's paid for with federal money, so it will be available publicly probably at probably next summer. Thank you. Another question is UDO available now? We are in negotiation with several publishers um, about including UDO in their product offerings. Mm -hmm. And so it will may not be called UDO, but the elements of um, of UDO by recruiting interest and providing supports built in will be in one or more products coming out soon. Any more, any more questions? Yes. Wait, I'll have to run out and get you. Hold on. The core key, is that free or is, that, is there a cost? It, you know, we haven't figured out the business model yet. There will be a free version of it. Um, the way that um, TextHelp uh, does this, which I think is smart, that there is a, there's a bunch of stuff that you get for free, and then there's probably some premium features that people will pay for. We haven't decided that yet, but likely there will go something like that. The reason for doing that is so that there are resources to maintain the site and to keep innovating new things. Yeah. We have another question. What schools are using the programs you used at the end of the presentation? 
Uh, we have uh, school partners right here in California. Alameda Unified School District is one of our partners. The other one is in um, uh, Culpeper, Virginia. And uh, we have a par another partner school in Boston Public Schools in Massachusetts. Great. Any other burning questions here? Dr. Blackerby will be with us for the rest of the day. Thank you, and, and you we appreciate it. things come up later, please put them in there. I will respond, and uh, thank you, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Before your excuse, just a few housekeepings. Don't forget, on your mobile app, we have evals. We are saving trees so that we don't have to um, um, waste trees. So please use the mobile app to do your evals after each session. We also wanted you to know that pretty much every schedule is full, every, every session is full. So you're really encouraged not to change your schedule from what you signed up. We do not want the fire marshal coming, if you know what I mean. And yesterday we had a few situations. So if you do not know your schedule, there are hard copies at the registration desk. Otherwise they are on your mobile app. All right, the next uh, session start in 15 minutes, 1045. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.